So um, in the end, I think the importance here is this topic is kind of near and dear to me. And I think that's probably why Jim picked it. I think most of you know Jim picks the topics based on uh, your feedback a lot of times. This one was kind of a, a an easy one and a hard one. And I'll say easy and hard because I started off thinking, well, what I really want to talk about, I understand PFM isn't the most prevalent thing we do, but yet there's still so much value to it. And by the time I was done, I think last night I had about 400 slides and I had to start deleting half of them to figure out that I couldn't talk about that just for time. So um, I still think metal ceramics is a very important part of what we do. I use it on so many cases. And just as an example, I'll just run through a quick case or two and give you some reasons when, where, and why I use it. So a case like this on a young girl where um, she had some some serious issues, some implants were placed early on. I'm not going to go into too many details today just for time, but in the end, um, after the implants were placed, and I'm sorry, I have to look away, you could also see there was going to be a, a veneer on the eight and nine. So now I'm dealing with implants and veneers, kind of combination cases. And you might be thinking, well, why is he showing this case for metal? Well, look at the lingual and you'll start to see. There was literally zero lingual space, and I would much rather have metal opposing the, the young dentition on the lower arch. Also, I plan on using some set screws for the implants, which I'm going to go into a little bit here as we go through the process today. So in the end, um, we're starting this arch with a combination of feldspathic veneers, metal ceramics, and all the little detail things that we, we kind of need uh, that I'm kind of skipping through for, for the moment. And the point of it is, is, is I'm choosing that material for a reason. I didn't just say, oh, metal is still great, so I'm going to use it. There are specific reasons of when, where, why I'm using these materials, and I want to be clear as to why I'm using them. So let me kind of work through that. One of that, one of the areas is space. And a lot of times I'm dealing with maybe very dark prep shades. I know we've been told from the from the industry that um, you know zirconia masks a, a black or really dark prep shade. Well, I think that's kind of baloney, um, especially in today's zirconia world where the zirconias are so translucent. Um, I'd have to use the old school 2006 white chalky zirconias to actually mask something. So that kind of throws that out the window. So in cases like this where I have really dark preps, very small preps, obviously there's tooth been over prepped too many times. Uh, there's a post in it, a million things going on. I go right to metal ceramics. This would be metal ceramics with ceramic margin for me. And that really allows me to control the space to the best of my ability um kind of in a, a more efficient version also for cases with longer spans sometimes i have much longer spans and yes i can use zirconia for that but i also feel like when i have smaller connectors which i will work my way through that as we go through this hour together um, i still feel like sometimes a, a metal gives me a better opportunity to control not only the space but the embrasures and the connectors. And also I do a lot of really involved cases as you'll see at the second half of this, where uh, this is like a zygomatic arch, arch case. Uh, and in a case like this, where the implants are basically on the palate, I have to be able to support that framework. And I have to be honest and tell you that, could I do this in zirconia? The answer is yes. Should we do it in zirconia? That's a little more debatable for me. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of zirconia against natural dentition, and I get it. Every company tells us, well, zirconia wears like nature. No, it doesn't. It's just, it's just impossible for that to happen because of the hardness and brittleness of the material. That doesn't mean it's a bad material. I use it across the board on many, many cases. I have uh, several big zirconia cases on my desk right now. My only point is our value, and I think I always try to express this to my clinical and technician friends is our value is knowing what to use and when to use it. It's not just taking the easiest material and using it because everybody else is using it, right? If that's the case, every case in the world should be lithium to silicate as far as most companies are concerned today. And I would tell you that material has values, but it has disadvantages. Zirconia has values and disadvantages, metal ceramics value and disadvantages. And our job is really to kind of know and understand 
how to make those work. So in a case as challenging as this, where I, I really need the support, because I have to kind of widen that arch, even though the implants are in a very small, shallow center of the palate, and I also have to not make it uncomfortable for the patient, giving them the thinnest amount of uh, metal framework back in their palatal area. And for me, this is a metal case. Um, hopefully in Chicago, if I see a few of you in Chicago, I'll be showing you a few new versions of this where I'm doing it half metal and, and half zirconia, but um, I still kind of live in the metal world for some of these larger complicated cases. Um, and I know that opens up a different can of worms for a few of us because some of the things I hear as I travel around uh, this country and others is, well, we don't have ceramists anymore. Nobody wants to be a ceramist. And that to me is another kind of baloney concept. I, I think we all enjoy being ceramists and artistic and creative. I think from a professional point of view, we as business owners and professionals have accepted things being maybe um, easier by pushing some, pushing some buttons and controlling it in a digital world. And we're not teaching people to be better at the ceramic world. And I think that's a flaw in our business. You know, in 2006 or seven, when we were releasing Zirconias, I remember doing a, a big lecture in Chicago uh, and monolithics was the concept. And I remember saying, the only thing I don't want people to do is think that the single molar monolithic is your business that you should be building around because you will fail five, 10 years down the road. I'm gonna kind of say the same thing today. If you're building your business around only monolithics, only doing things digitally, your business doesn't have viability to it. You need to be strong enough to know what to do and when to do it. And sometimes that requires monolithics, sometimes that requires nano-hybrid materials, and sometimes that might re require more layering and more um, feldspathic nature for aesthetic cases. And, and your value is knowing when and where to do that. So for me, with ceramic, I still think that uh, I treat my zirconia building very similar to metal ceramic building. And the reason I do that is because what I'm really looking to create is fluorescence in my restoration. So even with metal ceramic, um, I'm doing usually 360 ceramic margins when I do metal. Um, and by the way, for those of you who pay attention to these webinars, I think you know I do the same thing in zirconia today. I'm kind of back to doing ceramic margins. And the reason I'm back to doing that is because I want the fluorescence in my restoration because the fluorescence is in nature. And if I want things to optically work similar to nature, then the only way for me to do that is to utilize some of the um, key components of nature like fluorescence. So I said I put a lot of slides in and I'm going really fast because there's a lot of topics I wanna kind of run through here. Uh, and starting a few minutes late didn't help, I'm sure. So for me, the importance of, of, of modern artwork is, is kind of six keys that I broke it down to. One is going to be ceramic bond. How does the ceramic actually bond to metal as compared to how ceramic bonds to zirconia or lithium and silicon? Two, connector size. One of the biggest limitations with uh, other materials is the connector sizes from abutment to abutment or abutment to pontic. Three, is being able to use set screws. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with set screws, I'll show you what they are and how I use them. Four is gonna be screw retained implants. Um, the fifth one is gonna be implants in general. And then the last one is gonna be long span frameworks. So I'm gonna kind of run through all those topics fairly quickly. Uh, and, and hopefully if I confuse you too much, you know, just for Jim's knowledge, you don't have to jump in, but I'll tell you probably every one of these topics can kind of be its own entity and own case that we can go through. But I kind of shove them all together for you guys. So first off, ceramic bond. So let me be clear in the sense of saying that over the years, um, we've really learned how to adapt ceramic or opaques really well to metals. And I would argue today that the bond strength between ceramic and metal as compared to ceramic and zirconia or lithium to silicate is actually still better in the metal world. So we have better adhesion. And the reason we have that better adhesion is really because of, of the mechanical or dendrical processes. Um, dendrical means the, uh, the fact that after the metal oxidizes, we kind of get like these little tree branches that stick out under a microscope and those help to grab on to the ceramic. So um, not only do we have this 
um, mechanical retention, but we're also getting a, a chemical or the oxides. We're also getting a transition phase, and that's when the metal actually um, changes its, its chemical nature and creates more of those oxides. And then lastly, it's the old school van, um, van der Waals forces, which is really about the compression of the ceramic on the metal. So there's a lot of really great details about how ceramic bonds to metal. And I think the only way that you would really be able to see that is, you know, take a slice of metal, build some ceramic on it and bend the metal and try to get the ceramic off. And you'll realize that it, it breaks off, but most of it sticks to the ceramic. Do the same thing with zirconia or lithium silicate and crack the, the substructure piece and you'll see your ceramic just flies off. So there's no such thing as that the bond is better with zirconias or, or um, lithium silicates. And again, I use both of those materials quite often. I'm just focusing on the metal ceramics today. The other challenge is oxides. Now, for me, when I used to teach a lot more metal work back in the day, um, I only use high quality metals, 52% gold, high palladium, high platinum metals. And obviously they're a fortune. They're more expensive today. I didn't use any non-precious metals then. I still don't use non-precious metals today. Um, but the only reason I'm bringing the point out is because a lot of the newer non-precious metals are in a whole different classification than the metals that were non-precious that were used uh, 10, 15 years ago. Today they're more... Um, there's more beryllium's and there's more materials in those metals that really create very dark oxides. So what I did for this little experiment here, I did it a long time ago, is you can see non-precious, a semi-precious and a high gold metal. And what I did to those metals is I fired them in the oven about six, seven times without putting ceramic on them. And the reason I did that was I really wanted you to see the oxidation that forms on those metals. Um, it helps you from a few points of view. One, you'll notice that even quality metals like the 60% palladium or platinum there actually turns very black. Uh, and that's not great for us from a ceramic point of view. And by the way, the high golds, which people actually think is better, I would argue is not better unless you're working in C and D range shades. shades. And the reasoning behind that is because look at the oxidation color you have. It's almost like an orangey brown. And that's not really very well, um, it's not really useful for us in, in higher value shades. The other challenge is, is as you get into worse metals or bad non-precious metals today, the oxidation is going to turn into a much more gray black color. Uh, and this is why people struggle, especially with these cheaper metals. So for me, I still do metal and I still use 52% or 39% or gold in almost all the cases I do. And yes, there's an expense for that. I'm not going to lie. Second challenge is connector size. So let's kind of talk about the connector sizes. Um, again, when I'm working through zirconia cases or when I'm actually diagnosing my way through cases, my brain is kind of quickly going through processes of what I can and can't do by looking through the diagnostic information. So as an example, with a case like this, where we're going to restore an upper arch, uh, I'm going to look through all the teeth. I'm going to look at the position of the teeth, the wear of the teeth, the strength of the teeth after they're prepped periodontally. Is there movement? Do we want to connect teeth? Do we want to leave them individually? Uh, and my goal is always to try to keep teeth as individual as possible. But there are scenarios where some of the roots aren't as long as we'd like them to be or they're a compromised bone. And sometimes connecting teeth becomes more important for us. So a case like this, as soon as I start to look at it, my brain is going right to the aesthetic nature of it. I don't mean all the normal that we go through when I'm looking through the face and the eyes and the position. Again, that's not really for today's lecture. For me, it's more really about position of the substructure. And what I'm looking for is the length of the prep, the distance from the tissue to where the embrasure space will be. And as you really start to look through that, you should start noticing right away that if I was going to treat this as a connected zirconia case, I believe most of you are already under uh, or aware, I should say, of a normal connector size for zirconia should be four square millimeters. Anytime you compromise that number, if you make it 3.4 or, or you try to get more length and less width, you're really making your material subject to failure and breakage. Um, I think most of us would probably know that anytime we've had a connector that we've had to grind too much after we've sintered zirconia, 
most of the time we're just going to crack on you or your ceramic is going to crack later on. And so you really want to control that size. So if you look at these connector sizes, and I am going to splint a few of these units based on the periodontal health of this patient, you should kind of notice that I don't have four square in most of these places. And if that's the case, I'm going to start to lose embrasure space because I'm going to have to make the connector bigger if I chose to go with a zirconia material. So in this particular case, I actually opted for metal ceramics. Uh, this case is probably about five or six years old. And you can see my connector between the essentials, especially. Um, no way I would have had be able, I would have been able to create that embrasure space and still had a strong connector in, in, in most other materials. So this was a metal ceramic case to me. And I think you can see why I chose metal ceramics here, because look at the little embrasure spaces and where the papillas were that I wanted to make sure that I could kind of give enough um, support to the papilla, but also enough aesthetically that the teeth look somewhat real and weren't straight across. Okay, set screws. Sorry, I'm running through this really quick. Set screws. Um, I'm not sure how many people do those. I kind of live and die by them. We do so many set screws here, and, and I have Keon who's been with me for 20-something years, and he's kind of mastered it better than anybody that I've ever really seen at this point. Realistically, when am I using set screws? Well, I think we know in implant world, I always want things to be retrievable, and with, imp with angles that are in the anterior normally where you're starting to get a little bit too much flare on your implant, and we can't go screw retain, even sometimes it's the, the flare of the implant is too much to be uh, angled screw channel, and even that's not enough. And by the way, angled screw channels present a whole other challenge when I'm using tied bases. So again, this kind of brings me back to the PFM family, which you'll, you'll see more in the, the next case after this. So what are we doing with our set screws? Well, we can now actually create very small abutments. This is a metal abutment because I have a lot of strength and support here. You'll notice a hole in that abutment. And what Keon is gonna do is he's gonna actually tap that hole so the screw can screw right through it. The beauty of this is now we're gonna design a, a secondary structure, a coping in this case. And that coping is also gonna have a small housing for the screw. And I put this case in just for a reason. That's a lateral. Right? Think about how little space you have for a lateral, not only mesial distal, but buccolingual. Uh, and Kian was able to not only tap a set screw in here, but make it very efficient that I could still keep the lateral in its proper shape and form. The other thing that's really important here is if you look inside the coping, we've designed that in such a way where, because the coping is small, that we're actually using both the lingual and the facial parts of the, of the abutment so that the um, you know, when you kind of hollow out an abutment and you just have those little peaks sticking out, well, now we're actually filling into the abutment. So we're getting more support. And then the screw is going through the, uh, the coping itself, through the abutment and back into the coping. So it's actually kind of really locking itself into the mechanism. And it really allows me to create a much more stable restoration. And there's our final, and you can see the lingual is nice and flat and simple. So I think set screws are really valuable for us, and you'll see in the combo cases where those come in. Next thing is screw retain. Um, like I just said to you, when I'm using a tie base, I have to cut that tie base a lot of times to support the positioning or the angle, and it's very difficult for me to create an angle screw channel. So without going too far into the case, I'm just going to show you that Look at our screw retain provisional for this patient. And I think if you see how far out I have to come based on the position of the implant itself, and we could argue maybe not the best place to implant, but I think you get the concept. So we're doing a lot of work to capture the information of where we want the tissue to be, um, how much emergence I need to have, how I can support the tissue and finish off with similar gingival architect. So as I'm doing that, I'm thinking of all the steps that go through that. What I'd like you to take a look at is on the screen now. Notice my provisional. Notice the doctor's transfer that he gave me to capture that gingival emergence. And notice my final arrest, restoration and how similar all of them are. But also what I want you to think of, what if I tried to do this as a tie base? Either zirconia or lithium silicate. Well, look at my tie base. And look what happens when I take my tie base and I actually move it over to the restoration. Do you realize how much of that tie base I'm gonna to have to lose 
in order to make it work into that area. And obviously I can't use an angle channel here because there is just no space for me to get the angle driver in, uh, in a normal tie base. They're not built that way. So look what happens when I bring the tie base over. Now think about what you've done. You've put a tie base on, you've built up a, a pretty heavy zirconia restoration to match that emergence. And then I have cemented that to basically one thin wall of titanium because there is nothing else left. So for me, that's a failure of a case. It's not really going to give us the support down the road that I like, which is why this is a metal ceramic case for me. I could put an angle screw channel in. I could design the entire substructure and it's one piece that goes into the interface of the abutment, uh, the implant, and it really gives me the strength and support I need. And I'm much more comfortable that that'll be a long-term restoration for us. So that's kind of a normal process for me with some of these. And this is more expensive. I'm not gonna pretend that buying UCLA's today or a fortune. Um, there's a lot of, a few other ways around this, but uh, in the end, I still think if you want the best restoration, you're paying a little bit more than just taking the shortcut and, and the quick uh, end result, especially if your shortcut leads to failure down the road. Okay, let's go into implants. Um, I posted this online the other day just to kind of advertise our, our our first webinar of the year, which I'm always excited to do. Uh, this is something that uh, myself and my teammates here have developed years ago. It's called an evolution frame. And the concept of this was really an anti-restoration for the all-on X cases. Um, years ago and still today, this all-on X concept of doing these one-piece zirconia bridges, uh, on four, six, eight implants and, and their hardness and their strength, I saw it as problematic. And, and I, again, I wanna be really clear in how I say this. I do those cases. I have two cases in house right now that are all on X and they're gonna be solid zirconia structures. So I don't wanna pretend that I don't do them. I do. I just do them, let's say more cautiously, meaning that what am I doing them on? What is the imposing dentition? What is the age of the patient? Do I need white and do I need pink? I'm really trying to think through all the equations that will support the health and longevity of those implants that are placed. I'm not really as concerned about the longevity of the restoration as I am about the health of the patient. And as time goes on, I think we start to realize that we can make things really hard and strong and put it into a patient's mouth. It doesn't always mean that we've done the best service for the patient. And I always say, and you guys have probably heard me say this 8,000 times, if this restoration that you're going to make for this patient is your mom, how do you treat it? How do you think about what I want to do to protect the health of the implants, the hygiene, um, the strength, the, the tissue adaption, the aesthetic parameters, the functional, like all those things have to be in your wheelhouse. And it can't just be, well, there's four implants, I'm doing a zirconia bridge here. Maybe, maybe not. You have to really be aware. So the way we design this is with a titanium substructure, which is a highly flexible material like most metals. And then I'm going to actually create metal ceramics over that. So the substructure can be the all-on case. Um, and then I'm going to make metal ceramic housings that go secondary frames that go over that. So you can see here's one in the posterior. Here's the contralateral side. And then in, they actually connected a dovetail version over this. And the beauty of these is that I can actually lingually set screw them in. So I'm using the tie frame to screw into the implants. And then I'm lingually set screwing in the rest of the framework. What does that allow me to do? I have individual frameworks. I have a six unit, a four unit, a three unit, and that really allows me retrievability, uh, which is always really the number one key for um, managing the aesthetics and the risk factor with implants. And then I think the other thing that you can see here, which is really kind of a little different than with zirconia restorations is, notice where my connectors are at this point. Notice that my connector is really just around the titanium subframe. And that allows me a lot of room and space to be artistic and use my ceramics and my, my materials to do what I want to do to create depth and color and values and all the things that I'm looking to create. So it really gives me the best of both worlds. I won't bore you with build up stuff for this one, just to show you more of a final product where I can actually build these, make them look uh, fairly aesthetic, 
have them retrievable. And this might've been one of the first ones I did probably about 10 years ago. Uh, and in the end, I think you can see we can get something that looks fairly nice. We can keep it cleansable and it's retrievable. And if something goes wrong, you're fixing or repairing a four unit, a six unit bridge rather than taking an entire case out because when a zirconia all on X breaks, what do you do? You have to make another one. It's not a repair factor for that. And I always say, who pays for that? Because, you know, what happens here for my clinical friends that are watching is the doctor sells the patient the restoration thinking that the cost of the lab work is a little less because they're doing it all on X. And then when it fails, the doctor looks bad. And then they're looking at the lab to say, why did this break? And we have to make it again for free. And that's not really a really good business formula for any of us, right? I think we, we, we want to, uh, I said to a doctor on the phone this morning, you know, we want to um, under promise and over deliver, right? So we kind of want to make, make it clear that when we make restorations, I don't think we can guarantee anything for the rest of a patient's life, but we can utilize the most, um, the best material and the best options to keep that patient as healthy as possible. And that's really what our job is at the end. So I like these kind of cases and I do a lot of these. Um, so let's talk about some combinations now, right? So I gave you set screws. I gave you some screw retained kind of implants. And I think now I want to show you how this kind of goes through in combination cases. And I do a lot of these combination cases. So again, a really simple screw retained, a non-screw non retained implants. The implants are flared out. So we made soft abutments as we call them. We make our secondary frame that screws into the abutments. And again, look at how much space I have for ceramics there. And for those of you who are still using a brush, <laughs> uh, I, I would say, uh, I hope when you see cases like this, you think, man, I want to build that one. Because that's the way I always feel, even seeing my own framework. I'm thinking that's going to be a fun case to build because I have all the control and the space. So we can all peg that and we can build some ceramic on it. Very small amount of space for pink, but the patient didn't show it. So not the most aesthetic pink, but I think you get the idea. And I also do these as a lot of combination cases, right? So in this case, um, six implants on the upper arch. I think there were four implants on the lower. This is going to be a combination of crown and bridge on the upper and Toronto bridge with denture teeth on the lower. And I don't want zirconia opposing my denture teeth because that zirconia will eat through the denture teeth like nothing. Now I get it. The denture teeth themselves may only have three, five, six years to last anyway. But if I put zirconia against them, that time frame might go to one or two years. And I don't want that to be the case. So I want to have feldspathic ceramic against my denture teeth or denture tooth acrylic to acrylic in an ideal world. I'll just make this point quick. I like the same material opposing the same material. So I want feldspathic ceramic to feldspathic ceramic, um, feldspathic ceramic to natural dentition, or feldspathic ceramic to denture. Once I go into zirconia, I want zirconia against zirconia. I don't really want zirconia against acrylic teeth or natural teeth if I don't have to. And if I don't have to, that means I'm going to layer on even the zirconia. So at least I have um, a, a better aware factor to my opposing. And again, to be clear, and I'm sorry I'm going so fast. Of course, I do monolithic zirconia crowns and monolithic lithium and silica crowns. Of course, I do. So I'm not pretending that I don't. I just want to be clear that especially with the larger cases, I'm really trying to control the outcome of, of every aspect of the case. So a case like this where it's a combination, metal ceramic and um, Toronto bridge zirconia, you can see the, the final result. And why did I choose the metal for this? Again, how, how would I have worked zirconia as three unit bridges for a case like this? Look at the lingual aspect of this. Where would my titanium housing be and how much support would I have gotten out of that titanium or tie abutment for the frameworks that I've done on this upper upper arch? And the answer, based on what I showed you before, is almost nothing. And for me, again, if this is going in my mom's mouth, I don't feel comfortable with that. So I want to really choose the best restoration. Like I said to you, I work on a lot of crazy cases. This is one I'm just finishing up now. Actually, I just finished it. We're still doing a little something on the lower. Um, very interesting case because 
Um, this patient can't have any more implants. They have two implants that have been there for a bunch of years and they're sturdy and safe. They cannot have any more because of the bone loss and doesn't want removable. So what do you do with a case like this? Um, my solution was what you're going to see, and this is going to be a little controversial to a few of you because I've, you've seen, you're going to see that I connected implants and natural teeth, which I know is against the law. Um, but I did it anyway, and I'm going to show you why. So you'll notice that the patient had four somewhat healthy teeth on the contralateral side. We made telescopic copings on that, and you'll also already notice my little holes in those telescopic copings, so you know where I'm going. These will be set screw. I'm going to design a framework now that will go directly into the implants over the telescopic copings and set screw into those copings. So I'm kind of bypassing the rule of connecting implants to natural teeth because I'm not really, I'm now connecting them to telescopic copings. So you can see the set screws and how those work. And for those of you who are wondering the bar that's running across the lingual of that, I still do that on all my very large implant or, or large metal framework cases. And the reasoning behind that, one of the disadvantages of metal that zirconia doesn't have is I could have a huge zirconia frame and fire it pretty much 9,000 times, and I'm not going to get much change in the material, whereas metal does have a flexural rate to it. So if I'm firing these large span bridges over and over and over again, I'm going to start getting some pulling or tightening at some point. So to counter that, we do this bar going across the lingual of it. And obviously that comes out at the very end of the case after it's glazed and finalized. But for me, I keep that bar on for the entire uh, time that I'm working through the case. Quite annoying, annoying for some patients when I have to try that in. And they're like, what's this bar in, the, in my mouth? Um, but it's necessary for us to manage the implants. So again, buildups, pink and white, and the usual stuff. And this is where we kind of finalize that case. And then the last case that I'm going to kind of work through, I think I'm going to make this on time, so I'll leave a lot of time for questions, is about span. Again, do I use zirconia for bridges? Of course I do. Um, I've done full arch bridges. I've done six unit bridges, four unit bridges. But when I take everything into account, connector size, uh, opposing arches, what's on the opposing dentition that I'm working on, um, span that I'm going across, how many pontics do I have? I'm always kind of starting to worry that maybe this one should just go old school and stay in the metal world. And, and sometimes I do. So I'm going to walk you through one more case. And this is kind of an interesting case. And by the way, I could spend three hours on this case alone. So if Jim, if you're interested, tell me, um, do a webinar on SD because this case is a wild case that I did a bunch of years ago. And I'm going to kind of skip through some of the details just to get to the key point of what I was trying to show you here. But SD was a case that um, SD, SD was born with a cleft palate. And over a period of time, she obviously wanted to fix her dentition, the two front teeth after the palate joined. Everything was kind of a V-shaped arch. And like I said, I don't want to go too far into detail because I can start really getting lost in this case because I think uh, I worked on this case for probably probably about six years, believe it or not. I think I met um, a doctor who was first working on this case and reached out to me somewhere around 2014 or maybe even 13. I remember going out to dinner with him and the surgeon and we were talking through all the options and, and not to sound um, cocky, but I will, because I remember looking at the case back in 2013, and I'll just tell you that SD had two implants placed in the eight and nine position. The arch was very narrow. You'll see where the teeth are. And I remember looking at the surgeon and the doctor saying, you need to put the implants to sleep and we need to do a one piece frame on whatever teeth she has left. That's going to be the best scenario for her over the next few years. Well, the doctor and the surgeon spent about five years disagreeing with me and trying to utilize the implants. And I'll, I'll give you a quick walk through what happened. So she had her first orthodontic surgery, I think around 15 years old. Um, within five, six years, she had several more surgeries for implant placements, um, tissue management, bone augmentations. And when I met her in 2014, Essie was kind of maybe not in the best place of her life after going through all the surgical procedures that she went through and still having a very similar smile to what she had previous to all this. So 
again, without getting too far into the case, my, my goal of this was really to show you why I chose to go with the metal restoration fear. So I'm giving away the secret, I guess. Um, but the secret is this to me is going to be a metal case. So we started talking about making some new temporaries for SD. And I remember when we discussed it, the minute that the old crowns were removed, she started losing more tissue. And I'm like, okay, whatever can go wrong usually goes wrong with these cases. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. So back to the surgical drawing board, we're going to have some more grafting and, and tissue grafts going on. And in the end, we're going to have to figure out how to restore this. So I think we're up, up to surgery number eight at this point, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it's going to come back around full circle or I'm going to set all the teeth up and start getting this organized. And what do you think we're going to do in the end? Well, we're going to put the two implants to sleep. We're going to utilize her four remaining healthy teeth that are braced and strong bone. I think it was four or five. And again, I know that sounds controversial to say, I'm going to make a huge bridge on four teeth. Well, why is that controversial? But all on X isn't. Why is it okay to put four implants in the patient's mouth and, and do an entire framework from it? But we can't do that on four abutments or, or five teeth, natural teeth. And the answer is, of course we can. It's about managing the occlusion and managing the space. So I made SD a provisional, a one-piece provisional. That'll go in SD's mouth with the teeth in a much better position. You can see SD's feeling much better. And notice what's happening here as I'm kind of working through the case. I've now designed my framework. Notice my connector sizes. I have some areas where I have some good amount of thickness. So would that have worked in zirconia? For sure. But I have other areas that I don't. I have areas where I have two by two, one and a half by two, very small areas. And for that long span, I would have not felt comfortable going with zirconia there. So I went old school. I think she had five abutments. I think I said four, but she actually had five natural teeth. We utilized all five. Again, I won't work it through all the build-up processes. I think uh, you've watched probably a bunch of my webinars, most of you, who I've, I've gone through this before. But, you know, basic opacious dentin build-ups and my dentin build-ups, I'm um, starting to work my way through form and contour, uh, framing everything out and finalizing the case with my enamels. So here's our final case for SD. Um, this was a little complicated one because... I said to you before, I do 360 ceramic margins on almost all my metal ceramic cases and my zirconia cases. Um, this one was a little more challenging because it was a pretty large span bridge. Although I don't have an issue doing the margins on long span bridges, I did have an issue because one of the margins I needed to do in pink to support the rest of the pink restoration. And that was challenging because uh, VM13 or any of the ceramics I use VM13 for this case. Any of the ceramics that I do um, do not make pink ceramic margin material. So that was kind of challenging to come up with a way to manage this at the end. But here's our final restoration. Uh, and you see that we'll place this in Esty's mouth. And here's Esty smiling and talking and kind of being normal, which is really what we want out of these kind of cases. And... I told Essie to pretend she was really angry. So that was the meanest face she can give me, which doesn't look that mean because she's still a sweetheart. Uh, and this is Essie's final restoration. And I want to be clear that I think I told Essie from day one that um, this restoration might not be her final restoration. You know, it's funny because she went through six, seven, eight or nine surgeries and I don't know if the surgeons ever told her they might have to come back and do the fourth or the third or the fifth or the seventh. They just do it, right? Yet for some reason, we as clinicians and technicians are expected that we do it once and it's perfect forever. Well, a denture isn't a final restoration. Let's stop thinking it is. It's a long-term provisional. Acrylic wears, teeth um, move or migrate if they're being supported if they're supporting the denture, tissue changes, bone changes, and of course the acrylic wears in, in, a, in a quick, pretty quick period of time. So I'm not sure why we sell them as final restorations. And for Esty, even though this is metal ceramic, I was under the belief that I will see her again five, 10, 15, 20 years when things change. And, and the advantage of that is I might have better materials to work through. 
when I see her again. Now, I can tell you, I'll knock on wood, that I finished SD sometime, I think around 2018, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe even 19. Um, so it's been four or five years, and she's still great, and I'm knocking on wood to hope she stays that way. And I hope she's fine for another 10, 15 years. But if she's not, I'm okay with that. Because what does it mean that we're going to do? Well, she still has her teeth, hopefully. We didn't cause any extra forces. We didn't over prep her teeth. And we could basically redo what we've done or maybe even improve on it today with some of the newer technologies and the new materials coming down the pipe. So I really th flew through that one. I'm sorry. Um, for those of you who know lecturing, you get better and better as you go through your lectures. This is all brand new. I kind of threw this one together last night. So I really flew through it. Maybe didn't manage my time as well as I should, but I had a lot to squeeze in. I try to keep these to about 100 slides, and I think I was 140 here. So I was uh, two cups of coffee and flying through. But I think in the end result, I hope I've kind of proven my point that metal ceramics is still a really viable material for us. Um, we still have to be good enough to use it with layering and understanding and, and when and where to use it. And of course, I use zirconia and I use lithium silicates and nano hybrids. And I use all the materials. Again, the goal for us clinically and laboratory is to know what to use and when to use it that will best support the health and viability of our patient functionally, aesthetically, and hygienically. Okay, so with that said, I'll say thank you to guys. It leaves us, I think, about 10 minutes for questions. I'm sorry I keep looking over here because I'm, I'm manually running my computer. But uh, I'll say thank you for everybody joining in for um, for webinar of 2004, uh, 2024, and I hope to see a lot of you in Chicago. Thank you, Jim. And if they have any questions that I can answer, please feel free. Yeah, you got it. Thank you very much, Peter. It was very thorough. And I put a note about SE, and I've got some ideas on maybe do something there um, if you're willing to. Uh, sure. one of the first, one of the first questions is on the abutment height. Uh, is there a minimum abutment height you'd like to maintain so that you have enough retention for your, uh, uh, superstructure? Say that again. I don't see myself. Oh, there I the, am. I'm sorry. Say that, say that one again. I missed you for a second. The, abut the abutment height, when you customize or grind down the abutment, is there a height you'd like to maintain? to make sure there's enough retention when they glue it, glue the crown onto it uh, over the abutment. Okay, I didn't discuss that at all, but I think it's a fair question. So I think that the, the normal concept of cementation is two to four millimeter dowel and ferrule. So when we're talking about a natural tooth, um, you don't really want to cement a crown on a tooth unless you have approximately four millimeters of tooth structure to grab onto, whether that's bonding or cementation. For abutments, to me, it's no different. I want to have at least three to four millimeters of, of abutment to grab onto. Now, in some of these white and pink cases, you might see that the, the case is much larger than where the actual abutments are. But I think also you should have noticed that if they weren't direct screw retained, then they were set screw retained. So my abutment is really can be any height I want it to be, and then I'm coming over it with a secondary frame and sets growing in. But a simple answer to your question, just like cementing to a natural tooth, you should always be over the two millimeter number, and I would argue that two to four millimeters is the ultimate height for bonding or cementing. All right, and uh, kind of offshoot of what you just mentioned, we have a couple of questions about the uh, set screw manufacturer and the size of the script set through 1.2 millimeters 1.4 uh yeah so i'm using strictly the set screws i use are strictly from breed dent i think that's still the name of the company right that they change names breed dent um breed dent are the set screws we use they only make two sizes they make a, a 1.4 and a 1.6 personally we use the 1.4s years ago we found that they don't hold as well and they tend to strip out a little easier. Um, the 1.6s have been our, our standard for years now, and we predominantly use the 1.6 for almost every case we do. All right. And then uh, I know you mentioned it, but uh, still have questions. Uh, the type of alloy you use for the framework? 
Yeah, so I'm using predominantly 52% gold. It's high in palladium and platinum. I think we buy that from Argent now. I think they're the only ones who still sell metal, right? Um, it's it's got some indium and some other materials in it. It has it's a it's got a good strength to it, but it also has a flexibility. So I have the ability to keep my connectors fairly small. I won't get bending or or, or actually metal splitting ever at any point. But it is expensive. It's an expensive metal. You can go down to lesser grades of metal, meaning that maybe only uh, 29% or 30% gold and then higher platinum and palladiums. The challenge is platinum and palladium have become more expensive than gold today. So it's almost kind of counterproductive. But um, in the end, um, can you do these cases with non-precious metals? Of course you can. Uh, I'm not saying you can't. I just would tell you you have to manage the oxidations a little bit better. And for me personally, in my office and my business, we don't use any non-precious metals for many reasons um, that I don't think we have to go into. But um, I'd rather stay in the uh, um, the more efficient metals that I think are are better across the board for many reasons. On your sub frameworks, do you design them so they go straight to the implants, or is there an abutment, an intermediate abutment to the implant first? No. So, so the sub frameworks, or the titanium frameworks that that you saw, um, and by the way, not every case needs a titanium framework. Sometimes I could just angle. Um, sometimes I can make straight abutments, right? Cast UCLA's, or even buy titanium abutments and utilize those to make my secondary frame. So there is our money saver right there because I don't have to buy a UCLA, and we're working on that more and more. On the subframes themselves, 99% of the time, we're designing them to go straight to the interface of the implant. Every so often, there might be an implant that is so far out of the, the sphere of where we want it to be that we would do something called a soft abutment. And that soft abutment might mean that, let's say it's a an implant frame that has five implants in it. Well, I might screw into four of those implants, and on one of them I might make what we call a soft abutment, where I kind of just have a very small thin abutment that the frame seats over. So we're utilizing the implant, but not making it um, be difficult for us to screw retain everything. Okay. And then, that's actually uh, actually Jim for a second because it's actually really interesting. I'm working on some newer versions of this right now. Two versions. One I'll hopefully show a little bit in Chicago where I'm making titanium subframes and zirconia secondary frames, but very similar to the evolution system. That's one. And I'll hopefully show a little of that in Chicago. The second is I'm working with uh, another system. A friend of mine's company, Ryan 83, where I'm using um, multi unit abutments, but these are actually nothing more than equators or, or locators. And I'm utilizing these to really be able to change angulation and do our cases. And I'm hoping to show one of these cases at the um, International Digital Symposium in April. I think I have two or three of them that I'm working on now that are some really cool. I don't want to say advanced, that's not the right word, but just really cool newer concepts and how to manage some of these larger cases uh, going from multi-unit, from the implant to multi-unit to straight to the restoration. So hopefully I'll see some of you at the International Digital Symposium in April. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, it's always nice that we try to adapt to implant cases. They're not always straightforward. They're not always just a framework. Screwed down. Yeah. Sometimes you have to be uh, uh, very, uh, you know, adaptive to that case. Um, on your, if if you do cast two, if you do the gold cylinders, mm -hmm. um, it, obviously, to if you're going to put porcelain around that, there has to be a minimum thickness around that gold cylinder of oxidizing metal. If, if not, your gold cylinders are non-oxidizing and you'll have porcelain flake off or break off. Is there a thickness you try to maintain that you cast to? Around yeah, I think there's like, from, from understanding, I think from understanding correctly what the question is, is, let me kind of address it two ways. First off, if you're 
if I'm casting a UCLA, a UCLA is a 52% ceramic metal. So I can pretty much cast to that metal. Um, obviously, I do want a certain thickness on it, but that metal will oxidize similar to the metal I'm using. Also, if I'm concerned about it, because let's say you're buying, uh, you're not using a, a metal to plastic UCLA, using an all plastic. Well, all I'm going to do is cut away as much as I can and recast my metal to whatever is left. And by the way, I've even done this on titanium, right? Where we've taken titanium cylinders, cut away some of the interface, not the actual true interface, but the component above it, and then cast our metal over that. Does it cast well to titanium? No, it doesn't, but you make mechanical retention. So I think the simple answer to your question is true UCLAs are meant to be able to cast too. Um, but yes, of course, you need some, some certain thickness. Um, in the metal areas and where it gets too thin is usually around the lingual areas. In those areas I'm leaving exposed metal as I showed you in a few of the cases before. All right, and then uh, we have a question about, um, it, it has a, the hesitancy to connect a canine to a posterior tooth, especially in the lower arch and just your thoughts on that. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting the question that because of the lower arch has a higher flexural rate, the standard kind of thought process on that was that you don't really want to connect uh, from cuspid back or cross arch. That was kind of the only standard on lower arches. That's true, um, but is it different for a 75-year-old patient as compared to a 30-year-old patient? Yes. And then what is the material that you're you're doing that with? If you're doing it with if you're doing a full lower arch with four preparations and um, you're using a very rigid zirconia material, I would argue it's a mistake. You're, you're probably causing failure to the implant sites at some point down the road because of the flexural rate. If you're doing it with a metal ceramic, which is kind of one of the points here, I think you have a bit better long-term sustainability because the metal has a slight flexural rate to it and the porcelain that you're putting on it has a slight flexural rate to it. So um, can I cross over? Yes, but I am cautious about it. And by the way, anytime that I don't have to connect units or keep more individuality, of course, that's always the plan. Uh, splinting is, is very old school, uh, old school process, but I think today that's kind of changed in the sense that we're only splinting when we have no choice and there are pontics and, and, and larger bands that we have to work through. All right, just a couple more questions. One is on the titanium substructure, uh, are you milling it or are you casting it? No, I'm milling them. Oh, please don't. Who's casting titanium out there? <laughs> if you are, good luck, because I, 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 I saw the evolution of that over the years. So no, I'm not casting it. I'm milling them all. And um, I'm, I'm currently working with Panthera now to redesign the concept of titanium with zirconia over it a little bit better than the way they're kind of doing it now. So hopefully I'll have a little of that in Chicago, too. All right, last question. Your substructure and your superstructure, when you create the superstructure with with the um, the screw holes, do you wax the pattern or do you use a pattern resin to create that set screw um, apron? Oh, so okay, I think I get that. On the yeah. superstructure. So so on the substructure, we're tapping the screw hole, we're putting the screw in, and then um, Keon uses resin around that. Um, you could actually buy through the companies a, uh, a cylinder that can cast to it. Um, we don't. We just kind of utilize the screw uh, and Keon resins around it and then casts and cleans, and it's been pretty effective for us. Um, so we're casting with resins. All right. Well, thank you, Peter. I, to me, that was very interesting. I, I, I'm sure everyone else was, uh, that was interesting as well. Some new concepts. We look forward to seeing you in Chicago with some additional uh, new developments, new uh, technologies, new ways of doing things, new ways of thinking. I think that's important. What you do is uh, make everyone think outside the box. And that's well, thank that's, you. That's, and if you don't want to I'll just add, sorry to cut you off, that um, I know you and I worked through a, a schedule this year of some new some webinars, so this was kind of a new and exciting one, and there's a few other ones that I'm 
I'm kind of looking forward to. And also for the people that are with us today, I'm going to be having um, a clinical partner join me on two or three of the webinars this year that we're going to do where we take one case and kind of work through the whole case from the clinical and laboratory side. I wanted to kind of change the format because I felt like I did so many webinars last year that maybe we should do something a little different, but I'm kind of really looking forward to that. So we have two or three of them scheduled this year with uh, clinical partners that I work with that I'm going to bring in as guests to go through the webinars with me. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be fantastic. Uh, and the next one, I believe, is March 7th, if I'm not mistaken, but we'll, we'll talk about that uh, another time. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you out in Chicago, LMT Chicago, uh, next week, if possible. Peter will be there, so if you'd like to uh, stop by and say hi and ask him any follow-up questions, fantastic. Um, so, Peter, again, thank you very much for joining us and going over this topic, which is uh, an important topic. Thanks for picking it. Great topic, Jim. I appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you next week. And Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the first uh, webinar of 2024. See you in Chicago, I hope. All right. Well, this will conclude uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us, everyone.